Welcome to St. Mark United Methodist Church in Hamilton, New Jersey. Whether you're watching via Facebook Live or YouTube, in the name of Jesus Christ, we invite you to join us in Palm Passion Sunday worship this day. Today we begin the commemoration of Holy Week, and I pray in your home you will find a way to relive the story of Jesus' Passion. This week we will be offering a virtual Good Friday service on Friday, April 10 at 7 p.m. in the style of Taze. Through meditation, song, scripture, and silence, we will walk together through the events leading to Jesus' death, according to the Gospel of Matthew. Plan to be with us on Friday for our Good Friday service. We are thankful for members and friends of St. Mark who continue to financially support ministry here. In this challenging time, whether it's via the mail, e-giving through a bank draft, or by credit card, we continue to depend upon your faithfulness. Thank you for your generosity. Next Sunday, as part of our celebration of Easter, we will celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper together. So please be reminded next Sunday to have bread and juice if you wish to participate in this sacrament. And now we prepare our hearts for worship. Jesus. 
to heal the sick, to mend the brokenhearted, to comfort the disturbed, to disturb the comfortable, to cleanse the temple, to liberate faith from convention. Come, Come Lord, Lord Jesus. Jesus. To carry the cross, to lead the way, to shoulder the sin of the world. Come, Come Lord, Lord Jesus. Jesus. Today, to this place, to us. Come, Lord, Lord Jesus. Jesus. Amen. Our Palm Sunday Gospel comes from the 21st chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. And they brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that had followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Hosanna to the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee.
Our Gospel of the Passion this day comes from Matthew 27, verses 45 through 54. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, this man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. And the moment the curtain of the temple was torn in two, from top to bottom, the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs that were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now, when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified and said, Truly, this man is God's Son. We join together in the unison prayer, as you'll see on the screen. On this Passion, Passion Palm Sunday, we recall the shouts of glad Hosanna with which the people greeted Jesus. They were ready to hail him as the Christ, but he was not the Christ for whom they were looking. They were looking for the wearer of purple, but he traded the robes of royalty for the garment of a servant. They were looking for a swashbuckling warrior, but he praised the makers of peace. Today, O oh Lord, let us both recall and reclaim the life and ministry of Jesus of Nazareth, lest our shouts of glad Hosanna betray the Christ who came. Amen. Amen. We join together in words of silent prayer.
see this, but to the best of my knowledge, this is a soul survival. <laughs> a palm leaf that was part of our Palm Sunday celebration last year. This palm survived over a year due to a practice of my departed mother. For some reason, every year she would place a palm frond tucked it behind a picture in our living room. And there it would sit until the next year and the next palm frond was given to her. This one happened to be tucked behind a picture in my office since last year. Do you remember the last Palm Passion Sunday? We sang Hosanna. The children marched through the sanctuary, waving palm branches. Tammy was making palm crosses. I tapped the kids on the head with my palm as they marched around the sanctuary and had a sword fight with one or ten out in the narthex. And a few brave souls waved palm branches while singing hymns, not caring that it made them look silly. We remember. But after the sermon today, I'll gently place this palm branch back to where it came from. A reminder of a practice of faith by my mother and a sign of hope. Hope that there will be another Palm Passion Sunday. And there is coming a day when we physically gather again, crying out, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
Years ago, Larry Norman wrote a song entitled The Outlaw. Some said he was an outlaw, that he roamed across the land with a band of unschooled ruffians and a few old fishermen. No one knew just where he came from or exactly what he'd done, but they said it must be something bad that kept him on the run. Some said he was a poet, that he stood upon a hill, that his voice could calm an angry crowd and make the waves stand still. He spoke in many parables that few could understand, but the people sat for hours just to listen to this man. Some said he was a sorcerer, a man of mystery, that he could walk upon the water and he could make the blind man see. He conjured wine at weddings and did tricks with fish and bread. Then he spoke of being born again and raised people from the dead. Some say a politician, that he spoke of being free. He was courted by the masses on the shores of Galilee. He spoke out against corruption and he bowed to no decree, and they feared his strength and power, so they nailed him to a tree. Some say he was the Son of God, a man above all men, that he was born to be a servant and to set us free from sin. That's who I believe he was. That's what I believe. And I think we should get ready now for it's time for us to leave. Today we celebrate Palm Passion Sunday, where our liturgy for the day takes us from Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem to Jesus' crucifixion and burial. During this Holy Week leading up to the great news of resurrection, I invite you to take time to read Matthew's account of Jesus' passion. It begins in Matthew 21 and ends at the end of Matthew 27. Take time to put yourself into that story this week and see how God prepares you for the message of resurrection. One could argue that the Gospels were written with one question in mind, and that question is, who is Jesus? The answer to this question makes all the difference in the world. The Gospel writer Matthew seems more concerned about this question than Mark, Luke, and John. Remember, Matthew starts his Gospel with a genealogy, identifying Jesus as being in the line of David. At the Annunciation, at his baptism, on the Mount of Transfiguration, here in the Palm Parade, and at Jesus' burial, Matthew seeks to make Jesus' identity clear and known. As Jesus enters Jerusalem that day, the crowd placed their garments and tree branches on the road, while Jesus rides a donkey and a colt, the foal of a donkey. The crowd before him and behind him crowds out, Hosanna, and Hosanna is a kind of a strange Aramaic word. It's one of the few words found in our Bible in Aramaic, and it basically means save us. The crowds recognize Jesus as one who would save us. So they cry, Hosanna, save us, Jesus. In verse 10, we are told, the whole city was in a turmoil, asking, who is he? Who is the one sent to save them? The response is, this is the prophet from Nazareth. Now, this is a true statement. It just is an incomplete statement. Yes, Jesus is a prophet, but is he just a prophet? Everyone was looking for something from Jesus. And if not in the midst of this parade, 
in days to come, they would be disappointed as to who Jesus turned out to be. Tom Bernard writes, the crowd was clueless. They shouted praises while Jesus remained mute. They looked for a warrior king riding on a white stallion. They got a carpenter riding on a donkey. They wanted hype. They got a healer. They wanted a prophet. They got one that fulfilled prophecy. They wanted a scepter. They got a savior. They got nothing that they asked for and everything that they needed. Jesus was the only one who understood what was happening that first Palm Sunday. If we were in the crowd that day, what kind of king would we want Jesus to be? Do we want Jesus, the moral teacher who dispenses good advice to us? Do we want Jesus, the political Jesus, either red or blue, democratic or republican? Do we want the socialist Jesus who advocates for the poor? Do we want the conservative Jesus who preaches traditional moral values? Or maybe we want the non-judgmental Jesus who rubber stamps and approves everything that we do. Hosanna! Who is this man? So we jump ahead five days. Hosanna becomes crucify him. Who is this man becomes give us a rabbis. Save us becomes he saved others. Why can't he save himself? Matthew's account of the Passion presents us with a near silent Jesus. If we were looking at a red letter Bible that has the words of Jesus in red, all that we would find here is a cryptic answer to Pilate's question. Pilate says, are you king of the Jews? And Jesus says, you say so. And then as Jesus is hanging on the cross, we hear him refer to Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In Mark's passion, we have a near silent Jesus. When Jesus breathes his last, Matthew gives us this wild scene describing an earthquake where graves are opened and their inhabitants after the resurrection walk in the city of Jerusalem. Next week we will come again to this earthquake or one like it outside the garden tomb. Who is this Jesus? Matthew places the response in the mouth of a Roman centurion, who in response to the earthquake declares, truly, this man was the Son of God. The disciples are not even present. The teachers of the law simply mock and scorn him. And the least thought of person in this story is a statement of faith. As we have made our way through Lenten season this year, we've discovered encounters and long conversations Jesus had with persons who were cast aside. There was Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman at the well. There was the man born blind and last week Lazarus. And through these stories, we have recognized more clearly who Jesus is. So it shouldn't surprise us 
that the hero in this story is not one that you'd expect. As Jesus breathes his last, it is a hated centurion, part of the Roman occupation, who is the one who gets it, the one who understands, the one who answers the question of Palm Sunday. Who is this man, they asked? Truly, this man was the son of God. Amen. Today we celebrate the love feast or what's called the agape meal. It recalls the meals that Jesus shared in his ministry. You may remember Jesus at the home of Simon the Pharisee, or at the home of Mary and Martha, or in the upper room with disciples. The meal also reminds us of meals that we have shared together in fellowship. I think of the covered dish suppers, our midweek devotions, the roast beef dinners, and Easter breakfasts. Early in the Methodist tradition, the love feast allowed laity to come to table together when clergy were absent. And since clergy weren't present to bless the elements for communion, the love feast came to be a way in which laity were able to come to table together. Now, today you don't have the elements of water or tea or coffee and bread or crackers or roll. I invite you to find a time this week when you sit down with your family and share the love feast. Today we thank God for meals and the meals shared with Jesus in Scripture. Then we remember and give God thanks for the meals we have enjoyed together. And we offer our prayer unto God, Lord, for your provision and for the bread of life. We give thanks. And now we have persons who are, will come forward to receive the love feast. If you're prepared at home, we invite you to follow. Remember the meals of Jesus in Scripture. Remember the meals of Jesus in Scripture. Let us pray together. Most gracious God, we give you thanks for this community that belongs to Christ. We thank you that you wish to be with us and you wish to dine with us and you provide every meal. Lord, thank you for your provision and make us whole. Our closing hymn 
is for you there. Son and the Holy Spirit.